So the next speaker is uh, Professor Andre Vanderhoek. Andre is the uh, chair of the informatics department here at uh, ICS, and he is one of three illustrious alumni of the University of Colorado here on the panel. Um, so with apologies for apparently cable's not working, um, not sure why. Um, I will. Uh, I'll try to get us back on time, but I can't quite do it in five minutes. But uh, I'll, I'll try to stick on time. So um, this is a talk about crowd design. Uh, which is a, a little bit different talk than what Krista gave before. This is actually sort of asking, can people, a group of people, contribute to a design, and that group of people being from all over the place. Um, so let's look at crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing um, is a phenomenon that's coming about right now quite quickly. Um, everybody probably knows Foldit, um, where different people from all across the world contributed to protein folding, solving a scientific problem in 15 days that had taken researchers 10 years and still not solved. Um, everybody might be familiar with the DARPA Red Balloon Challenge, where DARPA hit nine red balloons all across the US, and they were found within a day um, by a team that enlisted lots of other people who enlisted lots of other people who enlisted lots of other people. So the idea is, crowdsourcing the idea is there, it's the act of taking a task that's traditionally performed by a designated agent, my employee, somebody that I, that I pay externally, um, and outsourcing it by making an open call to an undefined, but typically large crowd. So we just say, here's something that we need to get done, and lots of people can contribute to it. Why would we want to do this? Well, there's a number of benefits that have by now been observed. So the wisdom of the crowd. If we have lots of people contribute and correcting each other or agreeing about certain things, it turns out that they can make decisions that often are smarter or more accurate than individuals can. Um, it might lead to reduced time to market. In some cases, by having lots of people contribute, we can get some work done much faster. Um, it can lead to generation of alternative solutions. One person designing something versus a group designing something, we consider more, uh, more variety of, of input. Democratization of participation. Anybody can contribute, whether I am an undergrad, a hobbyist, a professional, I, I may participate. I can find freelance specialists on various websites. So I have something that needs to be done. I don't have an expert in this. I can ask um, one of these freelance websites and to get somebody who does this for a living. Um, and then for those who are participating, there's also a lot of learning through the work. A lot of people are on these crowdsourcing uh, platforms to learn. Okay. So there are platforms, and we're doing this in software engineering. Um, whenever I give a talk about crowdsourcing in software engineering, um, and I was just at ICSI just two weeks ago, lots of people go, oh, nobody does that. Um, but when you talk to the professionals and the people who are actually doing work, um, they are engaged in these kinds of platforms. So here's a platform called IdeaScale. You can get ideas for requirements for your system. Not the exact requirements, but you can give a sketch of what you want and have lots of people contribute ideas for that. Um, here's Mob for Hire. If you have an app that needs to be tested on lots of different cell phone platforms, you know, lots of different cell phones, operating systems, and whatever, you can send it there. And it will send the app and the test out. And you'll get lots of individuals, all with their own individual phones, testing it for you. Rather than you having that testing bank with all these, ad all these phones in, you, in your office. This is TopCoder, perhaps the most uh, famous platform today, where you can send um, user interface challenges, uh, programming challenges, and you have competitions where people will compete for about a week, deliver a solution, and you get to pick the best one, pay the best one, um, and have something that you can go from. And so there's, there's a couple of other ones. And I just want to highlight this one. You can't read it, but this is post the bounty, get code. It's like, for five bucks, you can get somebody to write some lines of code for you. And some of these posts are actually just a dollar. Um, and that's just a very different kind of economy and a different kind of skill. Um, what do we know so far about all this crowdsourcing? And, and do, you know, what do people do with this? Well, um, one is it is being used. I heard a fascinating story um, just last week again at ICSI. Um, there's a team at IBM, high-profile high architects, that are doing some little bit of sort of skunk works kind of project on their own. They're 10. They would like to hire some more employees. However, as soon as they hire one more employee, they're 11. And at 11 at IBM, you're now a team and you have overhead and you have a bunch of other stuff that you need to be involved in. So what are they doing? They're actually outlining the architecture, then sending a piece for to TopCoder to have them code it. And then 
they're integrating that, they're sending another piece away. So they're actually sending this, this, this project, they're doing this as 10 pro architects with lots of coders all across the world, all contributing individual pieces. Um, but what have we learned so far, sort of from a research perspective? Well, one is we know that things are can and are outsourced or crowdsourced. This happens. Um, lots of companies are engaged, lots of companies are playing with it. It's been observed that there can be higher quality and less expensive code. So in some cases, academic studies of these kinds of phenomena have seen that we can get better quality code this way. Um, crowds, however, tend to be smaller than anticipated. So top coder is an interesting example. So they advertise there's 800,000 people that can work on your software. Right? They can all compete. Well, in reality, it's about 2 to 10 that are competing per actual competition that is there. Um, and that is a little bit smaller than in some ways they like. But on the other hand, they're starting to learn that a lot of people are getting disgruntled you know, being in this competition. And there's Joe Schmo again. Um, and Joe Schmo wins this competition. And there's the next competition, and Joe Schmo wins the competition. And so th there's a lot of community management that needs to take place in sort of distributing who does what. So a, a good chunk of that crowd of top coders is actually much more dormant than, than we like. Um, there's the waterfall model. Um, and th there's, there's here some more criticism that what ends up happening is you end up following a little bit more of a waterfall model. Because you need to know what the requirements are. Then you break down the architecture. You get different parts um, completing it on the, on the crowd. And that tends to actually lead to quite a bit of overhead and can lead in some cases to lower quality. So the, the jury is still out on, you know, is this ever going to be a model that, that we can have? On the other hand, it's a fascinating place in which to play. Um, and so what, what's my work in this? Well, my work in this is asking, is it possible to crowdsource the more complex activities of software engineering? Yes, it's nice to send your test cases out and have somebody run it. Yes, it's nice to ask for a little module and have somebody program that real quick. Um, it's nice to run a bug bounty and have lots of people look at it and find some bugs. Um, but can we do programming? Or can we do the design of an application? Um, and then second, can we do this at more massive scale? Right? The promise of crowdsourcing really is, can we do something fast um, by employing lots of people? And so I have a research agenda um, that's looking at debugging programming and design, and I'm only going to talk about the, the design part today. Um, and again, there's posters later talking about other parts. So with respect to design, um, what we're asking is this. Because when you have crowdsourcing, you need to organize the activities of the individual workers. So this is called a morphological chart. And the morphological chart is used a fair amount in engineering design, where these are the important decision points that you need to make um, that are fairly independent of each other. There's, of course, dependencies, but you, you outline them. And then these are solution alternatives that you <coughs> specify from which then you're going to pick this one plus that one plus maybe that one and that one as a compatible solution. Or you might look at this one plus that one plus that one as a compatible solution. So the idea behind a morphological chart is to come up with the decision points, then structurally derive lots of design alternatives for each of the decision points individually, and then combine some of those into candidate designs. So that's what we're asking, can we do this with a crowd? Which comes up with three questions. Can a crowd identify these key decision points? Can a crowd identify alternatives? And can a crowd then, out of all those alternatives, find a complete design? So the first question that we're addressing is really the middle one. Because this is the one where a crowd can, of course, contribute, hopefully, lots of different solutions. If they can't even do that, if they can't give us diverse solutions, if they can't give us high quality solutions, none of this approach is going to work. Um, but of course, the other two are equally important. So we build a tool that we linked into Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, and in the tool, you have a little sketch panel where you can draw your solution. You can name your solution. You can explain it. And this is what you actually see. You get a task, design an interface mechanism through which users build maps um, with roads and intersections. So we put out a call um, with lots of decision points through this tool. And we asked people on Amazon Mechanical Turk to contribute. We had two experimental conditions. We wanted to compare user interface design versus internal code design. So things that are more externally facing, so how do we, how do we use this software, versus things that are on the inside, design some classes that do, or design an algorithm that does. And then we also did workers in isolation. So you were in the tool and you only saw your own work versus workers who saw the completed work of others. So the hope was that seeing the work of others would actually help me spur 
come up with, with better ideas. So the participation in all of these four conditions was about this. It was about 1,000 people per experiment that were interested in it, that signed the consent form. There's about 200 that dropped out as soon as they actually saw the qualification test because we had a little test that said you need to know a little bit about programming, a little bit about user interface stuff. There were a lot of people who failed to test, about half. So lots of people tried but failed. Interestingly enough, there was a professor of computer science who took the test and failed and then took the energy to email us um, saying that this was just not right and how could he fail the test, he was a professor and a bunch of other stuff. We had fun, fun times. Um, so, the, you know, about 200 some people passed the test, um, a little bit less entered the platform and then there's a, about a half to a third drop of actual people who then actually really submitted stuff um, with 66 folks to 80 folks um, submitting somewhere between one and five solutions. We asked them to create at least one and maybe if they could, we asked them to create up to five. And so we got 180, 187, 185, 115 solutions. So what do they look like? Well, they look like something like this, where we had somebody who did a fairly heavy drawing, um, on this case, what the map looked like and how, how the traffic lights were to work. Some other folks did this. Um, they had a drawing, but they had lots and lots of textual explanations. So we got lots of, lots of these examples. Um, so we took all of these examples, printed them all out, and started looking at them. Started looking at them from a couple of perspectives. One was quality. So we had three to four people rate every single one of these designs. Um, and then on the left side here, you get the quality score from one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, five to six, six to seven. So six to seven being highly excellent quality. Um, and you notice that there's a good chunk of ones and twos, um, some threes and fours, here four and five but very few of six and seven, that this completely solved the little design problem that we gave. Um, and at the same time also, that is sort of confirmed by this analysis where we looked at how many of the requirements were met. So we gave them four, four requirements each, um, and that you see that you know, three tends to be a little bit more prevalent than having all four designs, uh, four, four requirements met. Now the interesting thing to me is that this, so giving people examples <coughs> seems to, especially in user interface design, dropped the quality uh, significantly. Mm. So that was a surprise to us. Um, and it turns out that the more we look at it, it turns out that <coughs> these workers, they look at the example, they go, oh, I can get away with this one. Right? There was a bad example, so I'll give a bad example too. And that kind of spiraled out of control that we got lots and lots of bad examples until somebody good came by. And then you know, we got a couple of good ones. And, and by the same token, there's also this effect of somebody good delivered something. And there's some people who say, oh, I can't, I can't meet that. I'm, I'm, I'm not as good as that. So why would I contribute something that's, that's, that's better? Um, so there clearly is an effect of showing these examples and actually dropping the quality as a result. And that was, that was kind of surprising to us. In terms of diversity, that we did get. Um, so per task, we got on the order of 10 to 12 different categories of solutions. So fundamentally different ways of solving the same problem. That's something that you don't get from an individual designer when they're at work. So just having all those spelled out as possible options represents an important starting point for anybody who tries to take this as a designer. Again, with examples, the number of categories drops a little bit, but not as dramatically. In terms of overall diversity versus individual diversity, so people could submit between one and five solutions. So let's look at this worker and then look at their color. They designed exactly the same kind of solution five times. So they made little tweaks to their solutions, but they didn't move much fundamentally <coughs> different. And that was actually sort of prevalent for most workers, except maybe this one who had really four entirely different ways of going about it. So the diversity of the crowd is actually important compared to the diversity of individual workers. The quality across uh, categories, um, you see there's a couple that are just low. Um, these are not the, the good kind of structural solutions, but they ended up being some of the ones that actually dominated because this was that, that effect of, oh, I can just draw a map. And then somebody else would just draw a map, and then somebody else <coughs> would draw a map. To the dismay of the grad students actually grading all this and seeing all the solutions coming in, you know, when you see a whole sequence of bad examples, you're like, oh, it's not going to work. But then finally, there were some workers that, that did a lot better. So wrapping up, um, we're at the beginning of this project. We're not done yet. There's a, there's a lot more to do. 
Um, but what we're seeing is that it, it is feasible for a trial to generate a diverse range of solution alternatives, which, which is important, because that's what you want as a designer. The broader the input you have, the more you can work with this. Um, the solution so alternatives are very strongly in quality. And we have more data where we correlate to, with undergrads, graduates, professionals, hobbyists. Um, and it turns out that the professionals aren't always the best ones in delivering the best solutions. Um, it's important for diversity to involve multiple workers. Individual workers don't create as much of a diverse set um, as we would like. And displaying examples clearly had a negative effect um, because of the bad examples that were incident and that people modeling themselves after that. So what do we want to do next? Well, one is we want to repeat the examples, only displaying examples of sufficient quality. Right? If we actually have a human in the loop who filters out all the bad, crappy work, maybe we can actually get better quality. So we actually did this, did this experiment. And indeed, the quality did go up, but still not as high as having just no examples at all. Um, so that was an interesting example. Uh, we're going to repeat the experiment with a different crowd, um, top coder. And this goes back to the theme of working with industry. Um, we visited the top coder headquarters. Um, we're talking to them again in a, in a couple weeks. Um, they're very interested in this kind of phenomenon, the kind of things that we're finding, whether they can integrate this in their, um, in their workflows. Um, and then, of course, address other ways of trying to organize the workflow. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you.